Good morning, man. What a joy it is to gather and to hear uh, the gospel sung, the, the Christmas story in a different way, right? With great music, uh, with great vocals singing it. So would you give it up for our kids' choir, our choir, and our band again as they did that this morning? Man, what a joy to worship the Lord uh, through that this morning. Now, the first song they opened with uh, had a line. I think the kids led us in it there in the middle. And it said, generation to generation, we will sing of your mercies. We will sing of your goodness. And as they sang that, I just stopped and I thought, and I remembered, this is the whole reason why we wanted to go back to the Old Testament, right? Because for generation to generation, they would tell their kids of the coming Messiah, Right, The ones who heard these prophecies, as we're going through of Isaiah, they would hear them and they would pass them down to their kids. And their kids would pass them down to their kids, to their kids, to their kids. Until the generation of Israel that was when Jesus was born, they knew of these prophecies. What a beautiful picture of the God that we serve. Again, we'll be going in Isaiah. We're going to start in chapter 9. We're not going to be doing as much jumping around as we were last week. So you only have a couple places to hold in your Bible. Um, Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. And then we'll jump to the New Testament to see how this plays out. Uh, If you would read with me, Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 7 say this. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spool. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Man, what a passage. And if you've been in church at any time, I'm sure this specific prophecy of Isaiah you're familiar with especially probably six and seven it's one we hear a lot my encouragement to you this morning would not be to just tune this out because you're familiar with it would just not be to be like oh it's just some weird long hair guy up here going to tell me the same old same old that every other Baptist preacher has ever said on this passage right and I may say a lot of the similar things but if you're like me I know sometimes we we get so familiar with things, whether it be scripture, whether it be our favorite Christmas movie, or whatever it may be, and we get so familiar that that we lose the awe of what it means. We lose the truth that it carries because we're so used to it. And I would implore you, just as in Ethan led us, to come and to behold him. Because he is the fulfillment of these prophecies. Two things I want to look at this morning. The first one is a light that shines from the dark. A light that shines from the dark. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 9, you see it opens up in this way. that There will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. Now, much like we looked at last week in Isaiah 11, he kind of contrasts, right? We we don't get that here in chapter 9, but if you back up to the tail end of chapter 8, right, he's talking about Assyria coming and overtaking Israel. Again, this is one of those prophecies and one of those things that Isaiah was commanded to go and tell that probably was not the most exciting thing for him to do, like to look at a nation and say, hey, guess what? You're going to be conquered by the Assyrians, and it's not going to be fun, right? And if you read through that, and at the very end, verse 22 says this of chapter 8, and they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness, right? That's, That's the promise that's coming through Assyria. It will be dark, and it will be distress, not the Christmas that you and I think of. 
right? But I'm glad that Isaiah does not stop there because he opens up in chapter 9 with the promise that there will be a light to come. And specifically, there are two nations or regions that are mentioned, Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, for a quick geography lesson, Zebulun and Naphtali are at the northern part of Israel, right off the Sea of Galilee. So as the Assyrians are coming in, these are probably some of the first two regions that were overtaken, right? They were almost like the front line, and then they just kind of, the gates broke, and they were then the open door for Assyria to come in and conquer over Israel. Right, so they're probably not the most well-standing people in the nation because they're the ones through whom Assyria came in and conquered. Right? They're, they're probably not the class favorites. They're probably not the one everybody's looking to or bragging about because they're the ones that the door was opened. Right? The darkness came in through them, so to speak. But yet the promise is that while they may be in contempt for a time, in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Right, that this region is not just Zebulun and, and Naphtali, but it's also referred to as Galilee of the nations. Again, because of where they are, because of Assyria coming in, they would also be the place that a lot of different cultures and things would come and would mingle. Right, So it would be where the nations would be, so to speak, the Galileans who would come in the nation of Israel. Right, This is a place that they would gather. And again, you remember where it is, it's by the Sea of Galilee, right? Go to Matthew 4 with me. Matthew 4, we're going to look at verses 12 through 17. Matthew 4, 12 through 17 says this. Now, when he heard, that's Jesus, that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of, would you look at it, Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, of them the light has been dawn from that time Jesus began to preach saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand would you look at God is all that I can say right John the Baptist has been baptized and we understand from other passages in scripture we even went, looked at it in Mark that that the ruler Herod did not really like John the Baptist right he he upset his brother specifically because he wanted to marry a woman he said nah you can't do that right so we understand there's been a rift and he arrests John and Jesus hears of this, and what's his reaction, right? He kind of gets out of that region. He kind of leaves, and where does he go? But to none other than Naphtali and Zebulun, Galilee of the nations. That's not coincidence. Right? That's, that's not just happenstance that of all the places for Jesus to run and to go in the midst of this news, that he would run to this place that was prophesied by Isaiah, Right? That is the plan and the purpose of a God who has all power and all authority over every aspect of life. And we see it come to fruition by his son and by the way that he lived his life. Now, I think it would be important for us to hone in on verse 17 for just a minute. It says this, From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That Galilee, this region where Jesus would go, would be the place where he really started preaching. And again, what does he preach is repentance, right? That people would turn and that they would look to God instead of themselves. That they would turn away from looking to these outside influences, these political leaders to save them and to free Israel and turn to the God who is their God and who calls them his people, right? To repent, to turn, I got to fill in the well on Thursday night uh, as Vlad and the team are still out on their way back to uh, America. And I came across, we looked at uh, Luke 13, and in there it talks about repentance as well. And I came across this definition. Repentance is both a once-for-all event that shapes the whole subsequent course of the life and a day-by-day -day affair that keeps putting sin away. 
So this morning, wherever you may be, right, I, for so long I thought repentance was this one-time decision that I made, right? Whether it was walking an aisle, getting dunked in some water, signing a car, like having my name on a church roll, like, like whatever it was, I thought I'd repented then and I was done. And then for so much more of my life, I continued on into sin and continued to look to myself to lead, to guide me of where I should go. And it wasn't only until a couple years ago that I really got hit in the head by God. You, you ever had that moment where it's just God's like, would you just listen? You know what I'm saying? Right? Okay, just me. Cool. But anyway, right, I had that moment, and it was almost like, Ryan, repentance is not just this, it is this one-time decision, the first time where you said, hey, it's no longer about me anymore, it's about this God who loved me enough to send his son, right, not only just send his son, but to become God in the flesh and walk this earth to understand temptation and trials and to live that perfectly so that he would be the perfect sacrifice, right, that first time of repentance, but it's not just hanging your hat on that one time, it's about saying, okay, from this moment on, my whole life, every single day, if you're like me, a little more challenged, just like moment by moment, right? Like every minute saying, God, I repent. I'm turning from myself and I'm turning to you. It's not about what Ryan wants. It's not about Ryan getting the glory. It's about you getting the glory, right? The perfect, holy, heavenly father who sent his son to save us. So may that encourage you that that is what Jesus came and that is what he preached in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali to fulfill the scripture that Isaiah said in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Would you see how God's purpose and plan all comes together? Again, we looked at all those last week, and here is just another spot where Jesus checks the box of fulfilling the prophecies that not only Isaiah said, but all the other prophets through the Old Testament of the coming Messiah. What I love about chapter 9 and what you probably love because we're not going to have to jump all over the book this morning is there is another prophecy I want us to look at at verses 6 and 7, the ones you may be more familiar with. And it tells us that there is a perfect gift for the kingdom. We looked at the light that was coming out of darkness at Zebulun and Naphtali. Their tides had shifted and now they used to be the place where Assyria came into and now they are the place that Jesus began his public teaching and preaching ministry. And as we continue to go through the book of Mark, we see that the area of Galilee is one that he frequents so well, so we will continue to see this prophecy fulfilled. But not only that, he's the perfect gift. Would you read Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 with me? It says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now, let's break this down, right? If you're, again, what I'm saying, like, this is one of those I was so familiar with, and you read this, for unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and you're like, cool, 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 right? But, like, pick this apart, right? The, the two things here, right? It says a child is born and a son is given, right? And they're put together in the same verse. Now, think about the implications that this has for specifically the birth of Jesus, right? There was no heavenly father who played a part in Jesus coming to the earth right we looked at that last week in Isaiah seven fourteen. the virgin shall conceive and give birth right an angel Gabriel came to Mary and said hey look you're gonna you're gonna have the Emmanuel he will come through you and she's like whoa hold up that doesn't make any sense he's like I know exactly but the Lord the Holy Spirit is gonna accomplish this purpose right so that's the whole a son is given to us part Right, Because God freely chose to do that by the means that he wanted to. And he chose to use Mary and he fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah 7, 14. But not only that, there was a real birth, which is what we celebrate. Right, That's why we sing away in a manger, no crib for a bed. Like that really happened. Mary and Joseph went and ran and there was no place for them. So they had Jesus in a manger. Right, So you see how those two phrases put together like perfectly show that this was Jesus because he was given as a gift by the perfect Heavenly Father, but he was also literally born into this world because he was God in the flesh. What? That's crazy. Like what a God that we serve. It blows me away just to step back and to look that for such a small sense that for to us a child is born and to us a son is given that Jesus would perfectly fulfill that so well, so well. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Now, uh, if you remember, we talked about this last week when he said his name will be Emmanuel. You're probably thinking, how many names will Jesus have, right? A lot. 
right? The scripture tells us he will have go by many different names. But again, it doesn't necessarily mean that because we don't see the New Testament people saying, hey, wonderful counselor, or hey, everlasting father, right? We don't, we don't see like Peter and them calling Jesus that, right? They normally call him Jesus, right? And just because they don't call that as his name doesn't mean that doesn't describe who he is, right? These, these names sometimes in the Old Testament can be more of a testimony of who this person will be rather than that literally being their name that people may refer to them as, right? And we looked at that last week as Emmanuel, God with us, because he literally is God with us. You tracking? Right, there we go. So let's break these down. We have four names, right? Wonderful Counselor. Now, if you're like me, when you hear the term counselor, you think about somebody at your school who helps you, like, get ready for college, or you think about a psychiatrist or a therapist or something like that. Like, that's just kind of our modern day. When we hear the word counselor, that's kind of the picture that pops up, right? But that would not be the instance that would happen for those people, especially in Isaiah, who would hear this. The idea of a counselor is one of an advisor, right, specifically one that the kings would go to, that they would have their counselors, their people who would come, and they would say, hey, I have this idea. What do you think? And they would be able to say, yes, that's a good idea, or hey, hey have you thought about that? I think about Solomon and his son, right, his son takes over and he has his dad's counselors and his buddies and, and they get them both together and give them the advice and who's he go with his buddies and it doesn't really work out so great for him. So that's the counselor here, that Jesus would be the wonderful counselor, right, that he would be wise, that what he says would be just blow you away, right, wonderful in the sense that we cannot comprehend it. Right? And if we go through the book of Proverbs, we understand that wisdom is something so beautiful and so marvelous. And we understand here by Jesus being the wonderful counselor that all of that beauty is wrapped up in him. Right? Jesus is truly wisdom because he is the son of God. Right? He is God in the flesh. So that is why he is a wonderful counselor and he is there for his people. Right? And he comes for the kingdom of God being a part of that. Now, the second one here, we have wonderful counselor. We also have mighty God. Now, uh, if we really want to understand the kind of weight that this has, I want you to turn with me to Isaiah 10, verse 21. Isaiah 10, verse 21, is, is Isaiah is still prophesying and talking to Israel. He says this. He says, a remnant as of Israel will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. Okay, so is that, is that talking about Jesus there? Let me tell you, if you go to the Hebrew, uh, the whole point of this is that it is Yahweh, the Lord, the heavenly Father. So you see that the same name here in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, is the same name that, God, that Isaiah would use to refer to God in Isaiah 10, verse 21, helping us to understand that Jesus is God. That Jesus is not just a really great teacher. He is not just some man who walked the earth, but he is God, right? God with us, God in the flesh, the mighty God. His personal name that helps us to understand that he is so closely related. As I was reading through uh, some commentaries, one person put it like this. No other person has ever had God's name. And God is never called Moses Abram, David, or Jeremiah. So there must be something very special about this son that causes him to have God's name. It's so significant. And it's one of these that we can just, again, we, we're so familiar, we can just read over it and be like, oh, that's cool, and keep going. But like, Isaiah's trying to help us here to understand that like, this is God. Come to earth to free his people. Not from Assyria, not from Rome, but from sin. For all of eternity. That's this Jesus, this Messiah that is to come, that we get to celebrate, look, being on the other side of history, that he has already come. The next one, everlasting father, right? Uh, again, Hebrew here for father can mean so many different things, right? It's not just like a literal father. It could be an ancestor. It could be a leader. It could be the prominent member of the family, right? So many things. But the key here I want us to look at is the term everlasting, right? Everlasting. This highlights the promise that the lineage of David would ascend the throne forever, right? And we will see this in verse 7 in particular that he fulfilled this fully, right? Everlasting, no beginning, no end. It continues on for all of eternity. So this, this wonderful counselor, this mighty God in the flesh, this Jesus who would fulfill all the prophecies, he's not just somebody who's here for a little bit, for a couple of years, then he's gone, right? He's someone who will be for all of eternity, everlasting, forever, always, Whatever adjective you want to use there, like that's Jesus. 
He's always going to be there, right? There's people in our lives that we come to love, we come to cherish, and we know that there's something that's going to come one day, and it's death, and we can't escape that. We understand that Christmas is coming, and we may get that gift that we've been really wanting, and it's going to really make us feel great for about three seconds, and we're bored with it, and we can move on to the next thing, right? But Jesus is everlasting, will always fulfill. He will always be there. He will always be that treasure. And he will always be the Messiah from now till forever. That's the one who is coming. And the last thing that we know is the Prince of Peace. This son would come to implement peace, right? And another way that shalom can be translated in Hebrew is whole or complete. That this is what is going to be brought about by the kingdom of God. Peace, unity, wholeness, right? And not that there won't be quarrels or squibbles with God's people, Right, because Christians, we don't ever get in arguments with anybody, do we? Uh, By your chuckles, I understand you know that to be false. But unity, peace with none other than a perfect, holy father, right? The one who was sinless, the one who had nothing wrong with him, the one who never committed any sins, and yet you and I are full of sins, and we deserve to be separated. But again, the repentance comes in, and if we repent and turn and to submit to God, then we understand we can be made whole, reunited, and have peace with a heavenly father through the sacrifice of his son. That's the Messiah who is to come and the peace that he brings. Now, we keep going in verse 7. We see that this government and this peace, there will be no end, right? It's almost like Isaiah ties this together to really help the the hearers, the original ones, and us today understand that there really will be no end, right? It's hard for us to comprehend or fathom something that, that doesn't end, but like that's the truth that we see here in Scripture. This peace and this kingdom will never end. And this is the greatest gift ever to be, right? And we looked last week at there's a shoot coming from Jesse through David, right, that the Messiah would come from. And we see it here again that, that Jesus checks the box, right? He is David's descendant. He follows that through the genealogy. We looked at that last week. And he fulfills that perfectly so he will sit on the throne for all of eternity and to rule with justice and righteousness, right? And you know why I know that's true and that's great? Because God the Father is the author of justice and righteousness, Right? He doesn't twist it and mingle it and make it mean what he wants to mean. He authored what it truly is to be just and right. And that is the Messiah that you and I have reigning in the kingdom of God here, now, and today. Now, how would this be accomplished? What I love here, the last little section says, The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. This is not by chance. This is not by coincidence. This is not by man reading these prophecies and saying, you know, we're going to conjure up some plan. We're going to make some things happen. We're going to move some things around and and all this is going to work. No, no, no. This is the zeal of the Lord that will accomplish this. The passion of the Heavenly Father, the authority and the power that he has will be the means by which this Messiah comes. And how do we know that to be true? We're looking at a whole lot of prophecies just from the book of Isaiah for the whole month of December to help us understand it was not by any man but only by the power of a perfect heavenly father who accomplished Jesus checking all the boxes of these prophecies. Now would you jump to Luke with me? I want you to see here the promise that Gabriel gives as he's talking with Mary. Right? Luke 1 uh, we're going to pick up in 32. Luke 1 32. It says this, He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. In his kingdom there will be no end. Again, do you see how all of this comes together? How all these prophecies point to Jesus. And as we look at Jesus' life, the New Testament writers make sure that their original audiences right? That's what's, that's what blows my mind. Like Matthew was writing to a lot of Jews. Luke was writing to like Theophilus to help him understand. Like he, they wanted all of their original people who would read these letters to understand that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And yet you and I have the benefit of having this book compiled and we know this and we believe this to be true, that you and I can do the same thing. We can look back over scripture and understand that what God promised in the beginning of time when sin entered the world to restore and to redeem his people, those who would come to know him, that it would be fulfilled through Jesus. 
Now, uh, I had a church member this week just reach out to me as we were, um, you know, finished up the first uh, ser- sermon series yesterday or last week talking about all the different prophecies and just sharing some of the prophecies that he thought were really cool and inspiring and just we were texting back and forth and it was really cool and I, I commented on it and I said, you know, I really un- want to understand what it would be like to be like a Jew, right, to have this background, to grow up in this history, to hear these prophecies, to know these truths, and then to come read the New Testament and to see, like, like would it be, like, more awe-inspiring? Like, would it just be crazy to read through here and, like, understand all these things? But, but the more, like, after I sent that and I thought about it and I just stood back for a second, especially Isaiah 9 in the beginning, the Galilee of nations, like, I really was like, hey, you know what's even more cool is the fact that I'm not a Jew, and I can understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of all these prophecies. Right? Like, I don't have the Israelite ancestry to be the one who would hear Isaiah. Or like None of my, my great ancestors or people would be the ones who heard Isaiah speak directly. They were not the ones in captivity. They were not the ones who did all this stuff. And yet, I get to be brought into the fold, the family of God. Because from the beginning, from the beginning, it was never just about Israel. It was always about God using Israel to bless the nations. And unless you're Jewish in here today, that means you. That the gospel is seen all throughout Old Testament, all throughout New Testament. And it doesn't just stop with Israel, but it goes to us. Those of us who aren't God's chosen people, Israel. But we get to be part of God's family because we understand who the Messiah is. You know, and as I was thinking, just getting ready to close. I know we got a response song of Blake and the crew want to start making their way up. Um, is that, that this morning as we celebrate, thinking of this idea that God is on the throne forever. You know, whenever you think about Christmas, or at least for me, what, I picture this manger here, right? And I picture the scene of the angel and the shepherds coming, the, the three wise men, right? Like everybody may have a nativity at their house, and we picture that. Like that's, that's it, Jesus in a manger, right? But, but here's the truth today is that we're on the other side, and we understand the full story of Scripture. We, we've read through Revelation. We know what happens. And here's the promise I would give you, that Jesus did not stay in the manger. That Jesus did not stay on this earth walking and preaching talking. Did he do that? Absolutely. But that wasn't forever, right? Then he, we understand he was killed, right, on behalf of you and me. He was the sacrificial lamb that we could be forgiven. But guess what? He didn't stay on that cross either. But you know, it's even better than that. After the cross, you know, Joseph Arimathea gave up his grave. They came and took him off and they put him in the grave, right? But you know what's even better than that? He didn't stay in that grave either. Because here's the truth. And here's the, the really thing that hits home this morning about Jesus being on the throne that reigns forever. He is on the throne right now as you and I are gathering. So why would we not come and behold him for that? Because Christmas is amazing and wonderful to step back and to think about God coming in the flesh. But it's even more beautiful to understand that because of his life, death, burial, and resurrection, you and I can become a part of the kingdom of God and be his people. What a joy to celebrate that this Christmas. May we not lose that in the stories. May we not lose that in the familiarity that is Christmas. But may we still be in awe of it. Would you come and behold him this morning? I don't know how you need to respond. We'll have some people available if you need to talk. The altar's open, your seat's open. Grab somebody close and pray. However you need to respond this morning on account of God's word, I encourage you to do that. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you. We are so grateful that you love us. God, thank you for your son and for the perfect Messiah that he is. Father, may we behold him. May we not lose the awe of what you did by fulfilling all these prophecies through your son. God, I love you and I pray you be with those who need to respond this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together.